It literally is like a factory floor producing product, producing more product. A wheelbarrow containing numerous dead puppies. Never seen an area of animal crime explode in the way that puppy farming has over the last five years. And they're destroyed by drowning or by shooting or by walling in. We hear horror stories all the time of puppy farmers sort of just opening the, the breeding bitches up on the kitchen table with a knife. I don't ever want to see another animal go through that again. I was in tears. Is to get these dogs and give them a life because they haven't got one previously. There's a carrier bag, what appears to be a dead puppy. Everything that potentially could go wrong with a tiny little fluffy puppy could or will go wrong. They're right now, while we're talking, there are dogs in agony, so someone can have a puppy, now. Hello? Is it, is it Richard? My, my sat nav says I should be with you between quarter and half past three, is that still okay? Yeah, of course it's no problem. I'll, I'll see you shortly. OK, bye. Now we're on our way to Richard Kendall. He's been dealing in puppies for many years. He's licensed. Certainly there have been lots of puppies over the years that have been sick puppies and lots of unhappy customers. We want to meet him and see what he's doing and let's see what puppies he's got for sale. One of the main points of going to see puppy dealers is to get them to speak freely about what it is that they do. And one of the things that allows us to do is to check that against their license conditions. I'll turn around here. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Yeah, some I do, yeah. I haven't bred that little. How old is she? She's about 16, 18 weeks old. Let me put this one back. Okay. They are criminals, they are fraudsters. They want to make as much money as they can, and they don't care if they kill however many puppies along the way. They will just do it. The whole puppy issue is a, is a, a massive problem across the whole of the UK. Reported by the police to find a wheelbarrow containing numerous dead puppies. I, I've worked for the RSPCA for 24 years now and I've never seen an area of animal crime explode in the way that puppy farming has over the last five years. There are more and more people getting involved and it just seems to be feeding the demand for these dogs. It is, it's run very similar to drug dealing except without the risk and nearly quite as lucrative because if you bring in hundreds or thousands of dogs throughout the year and you can sell each one for anywhere between 500 and 1,000 pounds for a minimal outlay, that's, that's high profit and that's what drives this business. It literally is like a factory floor producing product, producing more product. These dogs that are battery farmed, and then the situation they're born, these puppies are born into is, is as farm animals. They're being fed with sort of pig feeders and sprinkler systems. So they're not even, they're kept in the dark, a lot of them in whelping boxes. So the pups are removed uh, too young. They're nice and cute and fluffy. They make great pictures online, if indeed that is their picture online. And there's nothing more emotive, I don't think, to the British public or any member of any public, any country, than a puppy because there's such an urgency to sell these pups and the condition they're born in, uh, again, it's all negative factors that, that end up affecting so many lives, from the breeding bitch to the new owners and to the puppies themselves. And these dogs are, I don't know, they're, they're not really, they're not allowed to be dogs, they're just, they're just machines for producing money. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Thanks so much. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Bye. So the puppies we saw today at Richard Kendall's, um, it was mainly um, four Westie puppies. We also saw a Cavalier King Charles puppy. It looked a bit subdued um, and a little bit flat. And then there was a, a rather unusual cross, a Cavalier cross with a Sheba Inu, and there were puppies seemed to be coming from everywhere. 
Richard isn't the first puppy dealer that we've tried to set up a visit with. We have been trying for some time to have a look at the puppies that are being advertised by a puppy dealer called Stacey Haywood. I, I saw your ad, it was a couple of weeks ago now, in Pets for Homes. Just wondered if, you haven't still got any available, have you? Just got Westies available. There is a connection between Richard Kendall, puppy dealer, and also Stacey Hayward. What we understand is that Stacey Hayward buys most of, if not all, of her puppies that she then resells from Richard Kendall. So we, we believe that they know each other well, they have a long-established working relationship together, and here we are. What you have to remember is that these people are con artists. They are setting out to dupe that buyer into them handing over their cash for uh, an animal they know nothing about. And that seller knows ultimately that there's a high risk that that dog is going to fall ill. So I've been on puppy farms. So, if, you know, if you strip it right back and you actually see the state of the breeding bitches, the, the state of the puppies, and it's really sad because you have dogs that are cowering in the corner, you have dogs with clearly uh, in pain, clearly suffering. And then of course, when you're not fertile anymore and you're technically useless to the puppy farmer, they're destroyed and they're destroyed by drowning or by shooting or by walling in or other ways. And another problem that we see is cesareans, you know, of course. So you've got a situation where, what do they do? Do they seek veterinary help or do they go for it themselves? And we hear horror stories all the time of puppy farmers sort of just opening the, the breeding bitches up on the kitchen table with a knife because if you've got, I don't know, eight puppies inside that are going to be sold for one to two grand, it's, you know, it's more beneficial to have the, dog, the breeding dog die and keep the puppies. So when we, when we talk about unscrupulous, unethical, immoral, we mean it because there's nothing, there's nothing positive about puppy farming. For us, it's been a very difficult decision to make. Do we carry on taking these dogs? that if we don't take them, are going to die? Or do we take them and almost in some way, it sort of feels as if you're supporting the system, although you're not. And tonight we're off to Carmarthen and we're going to be picking up um, just one dog tonight from uh, a puppy farm breeder. This one is being used for breeding but she's been diagnosed with a heart condition and we'll have get her to the vets as soon as we can, um, have the heart condition diagnosed, find out if there's anything we can do to make it better. And if not, we'll um, just find out what treatment she needs to give her as good a quality of life as we possibly can for as long as we can. I never quite know um, what's gonna happen. and it, and it could be that I get a phone call and it has to be that day, or it might be the following day, but it's usually within a few days the dogs um, have to be moved. And numbers can vary as well. I'm like, to tonight I'm picking up one, but it could be five, six, eight. Um, it really depends. I don't always know where I'm going. I'll meet someone in a lay-by or in a car park or a service station and the dogs get handed over and they don't really know anything about me and I don't know anything about them. Um, so there's a lot of anonymity with it. Right, this is the little dog I've just picked up now from um, the puppy farm. Uh, she's quite young, she's only about two and she's had one litter. She's in relatively good condition. She's got a heart murmur and that's why she's been given in. But if she keeps having puppies, that's going to get worse. And also, if it's a hereditary condition, she could pass it on to her puppies. Next is home and really just getting her used to being off a farm because she won't have been away from a farm before. Then it'll be um, off to the vets to have a health check 
and see if we can get some idea of what's causing the heart problem. Rehabilitating her, working with her, building her confidence and, and gaining her trust. I know lots of dog owners and I know lots of dog lovers. They're not the same people. So I think if we are to be a nation of dog lovers, we need to rethink who has dogs and who's fit to have dogs. That's a really difficult one to solve. Puppy farming's probably the worst it's ever been in this country. And, and that is because, to a degree, we've sleepwalked into a situation that could have been avoided. It's also been allowed to happen um, in other ways. You know, the government's advice is to see a puppy with the mum in the place where the puppy was born. But at the same time, the same government allows people to buy them hundreds of miles away by allowing puppies to be on the pet shop license. The other pet shop license that allows this trade to flourish are the ones that operate in a room like this, a home, any other dwelling. But then they buy in puppies from other puppy farms. And then how on earth a person can tell whether they've home bred them or they've bred them themselves, it's, it's just, it's like playing Russian roulette if you're a puppy buyer now. Do you, did you breed these ones then? No, no, no. Uh, my friend Dylan, he owns mum and dad on those. I like the pubs as well, <laughs> I do. I pubs, we, we, we do have them. They're only off of one lady that I have them off of, like, yeah, and that's Mrs Evans. But we are looking at some more puppies on Thursday. I okay. don't know exactly what they are for now. She's just said she's looking at a lot. Okay. <laughs> and then she's going to pick which ones. Like one time she went out for some jug, Jack Russell Cross Pug, and she came back. I opened the back of the van, and it was four Jet Black Casey Moshe German Shepherds. So it's okay. very different to what she said. So I just never asked. I just just deal with yeah, it. Yeah. Just as they come in, I'm like, right. So what we got? <laughs> You're dealing with a, a level of damage that we, as animal lovers, should be utterly ashamed of that is happening in licensed and unlicensed establishments. And then there are the puppies, who will probably, if you're lucky, survive, you know, for a few years, maybe longer. And if you're really unlucky, and so many people are, they will be dead within days or hours of you purchasing them. We have walked into a mine, minefield of, of canine disaster. That is really not the way we should be doing things with our, with our companion animals. But the rest of it is just pure heartbreak. To know that these aren't the only dogs that are suffering right? yeah. because of it. They're right now, while we're talking. There are dogs in agony, so someone can have a puppy now. And if our most cherished companion animal is being so badly abused, what does it say about what's happening to the rest of the animal population? We can't really be kind to ourselves until we can be kind to animals and respect them. It's a gorgeous looking dog. I mean, all, all puppies are cute, but he was just, he was just something about him. He had really long eyelashes and just big bright eyes. He was just stunning. He was beautiful. I looked on the internet, as I did, looked on Gumtree, Pets for Home. At the time I called, the dogs had already been taken because King Charles Cavaliers are popular dogs. So then Dogs for Us came up and they were fairly local. And um, I just went down to the shop and saw Winston, fell in love with him straight away and then picked him up and took him home. A bit of time before I noticed that things weren't right with Winston. We started with the head nodding, and then he started with his with his first um, seizure, where he actually went unconscious. And at that point, I actually I didn't know what to do. I was I was literally screaming down the phone to the vets, 
and then when he came out of it he didn't know who I was and he was howling, he was crying and then he actually just bit through my hand there. And then I came home again that night and I was just on, I, I was on tender hooks and he had another major fit at nine o'clock that night. But this fit in my eyes just went on forever. That's how did it affect you as well? It was horrific. I've never seen anything like it. I don't ever want to see another animal go through that again. I, I was in tears. I was literally in tears. It was, it's the most upsetting thing because an animal can't tell you what's the matter, but this actual last fit he had, he knew about it because he cried. He cried, that poor dog cried for half an hour. And I knew, I was, I was in tears when the vets was here and I knew I had to put him to sleep. They weren't like typical puppies at all, who are normally quite sprightly and into everything. They were very quiet, very subdued. Um, so I'd made a phone call to the vets, got myself um, an emergency appointment in, um, took them in and then the vet said to me, oh, uh, we suspect it's parvovirus. Explained everything to me um, and how sort of infectious and contagious it is to dogs and how deadly it is. And just said, you know, what do you want to do? Because the you know, decision is yours. Um, and it was a really hard decision. But like I say, I, I couldn't let them suffer any longer. I was very upset for weeks and weeks and weeks because I just didn't have the upset of that. I had the other issues, the vet bills that I was told were covered and wasn't. The insurance never paid out, so I've been left now with a £3,000 vet bill. I can't pay. So it's not just the aspects of puppy farming, it's it's all the after effects. It's all very nice getting a puppy, but if the dog dies and you're left with all these major vet bills, that's another distressing thing as well. Everything that potentially could go wrong with a tiny little fluffy puppy could or will go wrong. And the problem with puppy farming is there's no accountability. One of the things you do get across the board with these people is just their absolute disregard for these animals. We've gone in there, dead puppies just lying around that have been there for a couple of days. Uh, we can see there that the, uh, the live one's obviously uh, in with this dead dog. Even in cars, dead puppies in the footwells of top of the range Mercedes. Carry bag, what appears to be a dead puppy. These puppies are a commodity and they don't see them in the way that the buyer does. Um, for them, it's about making money. So if they come down and they've got a whole litter of dead dogs, they don't care. You know, it's, they care because they've lost some money. We, we fuel the trade, definitely. If, if people weren't so determined to buy a particular type of dog, then this trade would disappear overnight. From what I've seen, uh, a lot of the demand for these type of dogs, so what people will call handbag dogs, um, a lot of that is social media driven, uh, celebrity driven. People see people they admire on social media or on the television and the illicit puppy farmers know that. That's why the majority of the breeds that are coming into the country are things like Pomeranians, Chihuahuas. The second vehicle was uh, a Luton van uh, that was down as carrying sawdust. And what they'd done was they created a wall of sawdust bales at the back of the vehicle from floor to ceiling. And behind those, they, they'd hidden uh, in excess of 65 dogs because that's where the demand is. They look extremely cute. Um, they can be sold really, really quickly. They'll be advertised on the internet and sold within a day. And that's the problem. It's this ability to decide and buy a dog within the click of a mouse. If you can just get a puppy like that, and, and right now I could make a phone call, have a puppy here in probably two hours. Puppy's probably sick, pumped with drugs to make it look well till tomorrow when it dies. The fact that you can do it that easily means that I don't think people really value dogs the way that they should be valued. Again, I've had, I think I've had a lot of time to think about the number, the sheer number of sick puppies that are sold by these people over a period of years. Um, it's also estimated that somewhere around about maybe 40, maybe even heading towards 50% of puppies are now farmed puppies. Hello, is that Lee? Yeah, 
when when when's the soonest that I could come to see them? Anytime. Anytime you want it is absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye bye. I can't tell you what a good result that is. That's Stacey Hayward. We hope that we'll be able to to meet up and, and see uh, what's going on there as well. All right. Voicemail service for. I think we were at the right place. So, okay, well, I'll switch off anyway for now. Hello, is that Lee's friend? Hello, yeah, sorry. Sorry. He's in the hospital. And we were within about half an hour's drive of her house when we got a call from someone saying that unfortunately he'd been rushed into hospital. I, I think they, they seem to be, if you like, ducking and diving to to um, try and wrong foot us. And they know that other people are finding out more and more that awful trade that they're a part of. And, and they know that people are looking to expose them. Everyone wants to raise awareness of this awful, vile trade and to stop them doing what they're doing. And so I think they, they're trying really hard to keep one step ahead. And they know that, that we're on their case and we're trying to raise awareness. Lucy, come on in. I think most people, or you'd like to think all people that love dogs, would never knowingly support puppy farming. So it's just important to, to really highlight who are the dogs behind these cute puppies that you're buying. I think sometimes people forget about the kind of breeding dogs. Come on in. So I adopted Lucy in the March 2013, and shortly after I set up um, a Facebook page for her, and it was just really just to kind of document her progress really because she was so um, malnourished and had obviously come from such a kind of abusive background. So when she was rescued, she literally was just a shell of a dog and they would have just kind of used her as much as they possibly could to make as much money as they could from her. And it just really kind of snowballed to be honest. People could see obviously the changes in her and it was just a kind of platform really to not only share her sort of progress, but also to just talk about rescue dogs and in the hope that maybe other people might think about then adopting rather than um, buying a dog if they possibly could. Well, Lucy passed away um, in December 2016. Um, just all of a sudden she um, came very poorly very quickly obviously I continued her page because I just felt it was important to because it was a page to obviously still share stories of Lucy and people would have wanted to still be seeing pictures of Lucy but also the page was there to raise awareness and the kind of Lucy's Law idea was a, a big sort of team effort we wanted something that would remember Lucy in a kind of fitting way and I think it is a fitting tribute to, to her after all she kind of went through and the awareness she raised and it was just we just thought what can we do that's going to have a big impact on um, the buying public and hopefully make a difference to all the dogs sort of suffering on a puppy farm so I think the campaign is kind of just again like Lucy's page is really snowball people have really got behind it and want to people want to see change it's you know hard work but it's definitely worth it and it's definitely getting the message out there and we just hope obviously from from doing Lucy's Law that Lucy's life you know will matter even more um, and it will be a, you know the start of change for for other dogs. But Lucy was one of those dogs who like so many was bred from and bred from and bred from and her puppies were sold on and because 
it didn't feel very personal. People, I don't think, really grasped it. Now it's really personal. I think once you have a real dog that represents a campaign, you're able to reach people right here because it then really means something. It's not just a term, you know? Lucy's Law is the banning of commercial sales of puppies um, from third parties. So that's the banning of puppies sold for profit without their mum and away from the, where they were born. There's this whole argument about, oh, you'll just drive it underground. Well, how many puppy buyers are actually looking for an illegal pup on the dark web, right? Rubbish. The, the reveal, if you like, of certain organisations, certain high-profile um, animal welfare organisations in the UK that have been behind the scenes trying to stop progress. If they've been around that long and they've got all that money and all that resource, and the situation is getting worse, they've, and they've also got the ear of the government, something's not right. And you also realise that their profits depend on dysfunctional dogs in the system, and of course they have links with the pet industry. What they're fighting for is licensed third-party sellers. So they're saying as long as it's sold okay and appropriately, it's fine. But we know it's wrong whatever you do. So third-party selling is wrong. And when you have organisations not only barely publicly admitting it, because it's, it's, they know it's wrong, but their motives are very different from people who genuinely love animals and want the best thing for them. So it's uncomfortable for them. You can feel it. They ignore a lot of questions on Twitter. They ignore a lot of emails. Um, and it's because they're hopefully ashamed of themselves. Puppies should only be bought from the breeder, uh, seen interacting with their mum in the place they were born. And this is in line with number 10, with the government's own advice. You can keep making excuses, but at the moment, something needs to change, it needs to change now. And to constantly delay things, you know, the animals that it's affecting are the dogs that are still suffering. So hopefully the government will start to listen and hopefully sort of the, the people power will win through and they'll see that there is a public want for, for change, for just so things start to get a bit better for supposedly man's best friend. How difficult is it to sort of hold your tongue when you're dealing with these people that you know are treating dogs in such a ghastly way? I think sometimes you've got to look beyond that because it would be, it would be so easy to respond and and to berate them and, and say all the things that you feel about them, but that's not gonna save any dogs. And that's the most important thing, is to get these dogs cared for, loved, get the veterinary treatment that they need and give them a life because they haven't got one previously. It has a huge toll on me and, and obviously on the volunteers that work in the rescue, the, the other people that help with these animals, has a big impact. But it's not really about us, is it? It's about what we can do to change the lives of these animals. Even the ones that haven't got years, but it's, it's that in itself is rewarding. You know, she's, she's gonna die with somebody who cares, not in a shed, not in a barn, somebody holding her and talking to her, she won't be alone. And, and that's so important because every animal deserves a good life, but they deserve a good death too. And that's something that we can give them. And, and that might sound defeatist and it isn't at all, but for some of them, that's all we can give them is a good death but hopefully for most of them, we can give them years. But what it will do is it will slowly restrict the amount of dogs coming into the country, which will then obviously increase the homegrown market. It will make the buyers happier because the quality of the dog that they're gonna be buying is a bit more assured. Um, and equally across the board, you need to stop these dogs being trucked across Europe um, just to feed the UK market. If we, if we can stop that, then that's got to be something positive. That will be, we'll be taking the right steps to actually stopping this ridiculous trade that we've got at the moment. In terms of future puppy sales and the welfare of puppies, Lucy's law quite simply would just protect them. People would know where they were getting their dogs from. People would know 
exactly who bred them. So you're in a situation where you're, you're almost cleaning up the, the dog, dog industry by forcing people to be responsible, ethical, moral, and making the, potentially the, the biggest difference to the future of dogs this country or the world's ever seen. All our dreams come true if people like this are never allowed to sell puppies to the public again. These are people who have traded on misery for years. They've broken hearts um, along the way of what they're doing and I wouldn't trust them ever. I mean, people have always wanted an end to puppy farming. Now they've got it. I like to go to sleep at night thinking we are this close to making real change through decisive action. You know, Lucy could be the dog that saves every dog's life. Please, come on in. And I genuinely believe she still can be. And what a tribute to a dog that went through so much pain and suffering at the hands of man. And hopefully will come out the other end as the dog that actually changes the law. It's incredibly sad, but it's also incredibly exciting at the same time.